you. Come on. <laughs> Have fun, Pastor Chris. I will. <laughs> I'll still be alive at the end, I promise. We'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a special time of year. It's interesting that we're going to be talking about Passover and why are we doing this. Passover and Easter Sunday, the uh, Resurrection Sunday, always fall hand in hand. The timing is always is always the same. It's whether you can be on the same day, it can be a couple of weeks away, but it always falls right next to each other. And it's really important that it does because they parallel each other very much so. Jim, can I have the first uh, slide, please? Okay, great. What you're looking over there is a Seder plate. That is part of the actual Passover Seder. Now, Pastor and I have talked about uh, uh, doing a, an actual Messianic Passover Seder. What is that? Well, Messianic Passover Seder is one where um, we do the Seder, celebrate the Passover, but we do it from Jesus' perspective. And uh, we had actually discussed about uh, doing one this year, but of course the virus has really uh, stopped us from mm -hmm. doing it. Uh, however, Lord willing, next year as things pass, uh, we will be conducting that. And today you're going to get a little taste of what the Passover is about and how the Passover uh, is joined to... Um, to a Resurrection Sunday. The, um, the uh, service of the Passover uh, can be long, but uh, it, it's also a meal, and, uh, and that's the good part, because while you're going to hear about uh, the uh, parallels between the Passover and Resurrection Sunday, once you actually experience the actual Passover, has anybody ever been to a Passover Seder? We have a couple that have been to an actual Passover Seder. It's good. Uh, we, will, uh, we will conduct that with the meal, and it's going to be even more of a tremendous experience to try to uh, put together what Jesus has done in his life, his death, burial, and resurrection, and they fit together like a glove. So that's what basically we're doing. We're going to examine the relationship between Jesus, the Passover, and, to need, and the need to understand why it's so important. Now, as, as Pastor Chris talked about, yes, uh, a number of years ago, the Holy Spirit moved on me in the, the mid-1990s to be involved in Jewish ministry. I, I uh, hooked up with a, uh, with a uh, Messianic uh, believer's church. And what is that? Well, there's basically Jewish people that believe in Jesus. But they do it from a, from a Jewish perspective. Well, that led me to a number of different um, experiences. The next step after that is being very much a part of that congregation. And then uh, I ended up, uh, I just felt like the Holy Spirit was leading me and uh, one other friend of mine at that congregation to go investigate the Orthodox Jewish synagogues and what they were all about. Now, he was Jewish and he wanted to know about his Jewish background. But for me, I unwittingly, when he asked me to go, I unwittingly said yes. <laughs> and uh, it was an it's an interesting experience. And my pastor said, for two years, I uh, worshipped with them. When I use the word worship, uh, they worship uh, they worship uh, very differently than we do in um, than we do in a standard church here. Uh, the, uh, the the synagogue, uh, of course, run by Orthodox rabbis who had no clue about Jesus. They only know what they hear and what they've heard in the past. Um, I had to endure a lot of the jokes, a lot of the, a lot of the fun things that they talk about Christians with, because only one rabbi knew that I was a Christian. And um, in fact, the very first day that I met him, uh, he was very nice, but the first thing he said was, I want you to know that we are not idolaters. Meaning that when it comes to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, they took that to mean that we believe in three gods. And so they called, they called Christians idolaters, ones who practice idolatry, that we believe in three gods. And of course that's not the case. 
Um, but anyway, the rabbi and I got very, very friendly, and uh, he was wonderful. Uh, that's where I started learning Hebrew, and um, we, I was there for two years. I celebrated with them. I was in the synagogues every Sabbath morning. I celebrated the uh, services with them, the, um, the various festivals with them. Uh, it was an incredible experience, but the Holy Spirit was moving on me to show me that I'm on their territory, they're not on mine. And I am to listen to what they do and how they do it and what they're doing and to listen and to, uh, and to absorb it. Why this was happening, this was all thrust on me so fast I can't even imagine it. But it, it was thrust on me fast. But that's how sometimes the Holy Spirit does things with me. And, um, and I learned a lot. Now, of course, being born in New York City and, uh, and living in New Jersey and just coming down here uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was exposed to a lot of Jewish people. So being around that area, and Patty can tell you as well, that there's a lot of Jew Jewish people around there, and um, there's more of a Jewish mindset there. Here, not so much. So, um, so it's going to be an experience, which is some of the things that you're going to hear. And uh, Lord willing, uh, you will begin to uh, see how they all fit together. Now, the way we're going to approach this is that I'm going to start from the Old Testament book of Exodus, and we're going to go through this, uh, in, in, in a few verses, and we're going to keep going until we go into the New Testament, and we're going to talk about various uh, factors in the, um, in the Passover. Some of the things you see up over here, you see matzah, you see, a, uh, you see a, a cup over here, of course, candles. These are all things that are part of the Passover Seder, but they have tremendous meaning, not only to Jewish people, but as we go along, they have tremendous meaning to Christians. And you're going to see through that, through those pieces of bread, through those unleavened bread, you're going to see Jesus come alive. Now again, when it comes to the Passover Seder, you see this doubly, triply how this is going to work. But right now, this is what we have to work with, and this is going to be this is going to be an incredible trip. So there's going to be a lot of scripture that I'm going to read. Don't if you want to open up to Ex Exodus chapter 12, that's fine. I'm going to skip along various verses. Just follow along with me, follow, listen to what I'm saying, and as we get toward the end of this, we're going to put this all together. And we put it all together, you're going to see a tremendous, tremendous parallel. Now, most of us know the actual Passover story. I'm not going to go through that. You can go through Exodus chapter 3 and on, and it will explain to you uh, Joseph going into Egypt and, and king that arose that did not know Joseph, and for 430 years the Jewish people were in Egypt. Now it comes time that they were, that they were going to um, be delivered from Egypt. They were in harsh bondage at the time. And I'm going to go ahead and start from Exodus chapter 12, and I'm going to read some various verses. So let's try to follow along. Starting at verse 3, speak, uh, speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorposts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs that they shall eat. And thus you shall eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, I and the Lord. And the Lord shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened. Because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared themselves any food. All right, there's a lot there. I'm just going to touch on one or two things, and that is that the plagues were happening. Uh, God had had enough of, of Egypt. He was delivering his Jewish people. They were to leave. Uh, the Pharaoh was belligerent. 
and plagues came upon Egypt. When the death angel came, came through, we know that there was a sacrificial lamb that was given, what is called the Paschal lamb. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. But Paschal just simply means a Passover, so we'll say Passover lamb. They put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the, what's called the lintel, or the top part of the, of the door. And so when the death angel passed by, they would see the blood and know that they were, they were not to be affected by any plagues, the death, the death plague, the tenth and final plague. Okay, next slide, Jim. This is very, very important. This is basically what Passover is talking about. And you're going to see that not only for the Passover do we use, do we see this, but you're going to see it in our Christian life, and you're going to see it in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Passover is the retelling of bondage, deliverance, and redemption. The Jewish people were in bondage. They were in bondage for about 430 years, we're told. There was a deliverance from God. And there was redemption. They were, they were brought forth. The animals that were sacrificed started in redemption. We as well are in that mode. Now when we talk about Passover, we'll leave this up here for a little while. When we talk about Passover, we actually talk about two festivals. Now, I know we include fest, uh, we, we include the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread with Passover, but they are technically two, pe two uh, festivals. You had the Passover, which was the first day. The Passover festival actually lasts for eight days, but the, uh, you had first the Passover, which was the first day, and you had seven days of unleavened bread after that, where the Jewish people were to only eat unleavened bread, like you're seeing over here, the matzah. Now there's different types of unleavened bread, and we're going to discuss that in a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and read another couple of parts of Exodus chapter 12, so that uh, you would get to get an idea of what this Feast of Unleavened Bread is about. Now starting at verse 14 from Exodus chapter 12, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that shall that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this self same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In this first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eats that which is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. This concept of unleavened bread is, 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 is really big. And uh, there were, when I look at, when we look at the, at the bread over here, the, this matzo over here, that's not the only type of unleavened bread. And uh, people have, uh, have eaten unleavened bread a lot. Some, some various forms of hard, thin, flat breads are, are unleavened as well. Some are, some are not. But uh, this is primarily what we have over here, uh, is unleavened bread. And you see two types over here. We'll get into that in a moment. Now, there's a significance in the matzah, both to the Old and New Testament redemption. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, I want to reiterate something. It said, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. Now, that first day was the actual Passover day. So Jewish people today, they will, they will uh, take the leaven out of, out, of their, out of their homes. I'll explain that to you in a few minutes. <clears throat> For whosoever eats leavened bread from the, day, from, from the first day to the seventh day, the soul shall be cut off from Israel. And this is really important. God's really making a point here that unleavened bread was not to be found in the houses of the Jewish people 
during this time. That doesn't mean they never ate unleavened bread. They ate leavened bread. The bread that rises, they've eaten that all the time. Perhaps some of you have seen that type of bread. It's called challah bread. It's long, and you'll see the tops of it, they, they're kind of curved over as such like that. It's leavened bread. And there's other types of leaven, leavening uh, processes as well. What do we mean by the word matzah? Well, basically the word matzah, if you, if you look it up, the word matzah basically is the unleavened bread. That's basically all that, all that is. They're basically the dough, work the dough, and work the dough, work the dough. And, uh, but that's basically, that's basically uh, what, the, what the Jewish people used. They used kneading troughs. And the matzah was, was cooked on some heated rocks. Now, why, why was it cooked that way? Well, don't forget, and we're going to read this again, that the Jewish people had to leave. It wasn't something that they could hang around. Uh, they, they, were, they were in a lot of, a lot of problems, and, and the Pharaoh was getting constantly, constantly more aggravated with the Jewish people, with, with Moses' declaration of, of asking them to leave and saying, let my people go. And um, they had to leave. And so they had to leave in a hurry, which is, which is really, really important. So the matzah that, uh, that, they, uh, that they ate was cooked, on some, either sun heated rocks. And don't forget, you're in Egypt now. And in Egypt, the sun was baking down on the rocks in the, um, in the zone that they were in. And so that, those rocks were very, very well, they were very well suited for cooking bread. Uh, they would put the bread on these rocks. Sometimes they used certain types of grills or and they had things of that nature, but they, they, the, the, the rocks would be heated as well. And when you're in a hurry and you had to get out, that was the, the absolute fastest way that um, that you could uh, that you could get out and have food with you. I'm going to read from Exodus 12, verse 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry or wait. Neither had they prepared themselves any food. Okay, so. I said, they had to leave quickly. Matzah, because of this exodus, matzah is described by the Jewish people as bread of affliction. Why do they say that? Because matzah reminds them of the time that they had to exit Egypt. Now, in any religion, uh, we worship, and what we do is we remember. And this is really important. A lot of times people have something against Jewish people and they say, well, they go back to the Old Testament and, and they talk about such things like that and uh, we live in the New Testament and we're in the here and now. But we have to remember that any church service, any service at all, when the events happen hundreds and thousands, of, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of years ago, it's always a remembrance. We do everything in remembrance. In fact, in front of here, in front of this desk, it says, do this in remembrance of me. Everything we do is in memory of. We don't want to forget. And it's important that we don't forget uh, what we do and what we worship and who we worship. We're constantly reminded. We do this in services. We sing. There's, there's sermons. People pray. And we're constantly giving credit and glory to God. And Jewish people do the same thing in their synagogues. They remember. And when they see that matzah, when they see the, the actual Seder service, they, that is a service, a service of remembrance. All right. Lord willing, when we have the Seder next year, it will be a remembrance service. However, for a Christian, it's not only a remembrance service of the delivery, deliverance from Egypt, but it's a remembrance of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And we will remember Jesus over and over, just like we do in a church service. But here we have a meal, and even in the meal, there are signs of deliverance. There are signs of remembrance in our belief system. So, all of this is for that, and that's where that mantra really comes in. Okay, so they could not uh, prepare any foods for themselves. Matza, as the bread of affliction for the Jewish people, for us, I will, I will say, that matzah is the bread of redemption because it shows us um, Jesus and his life and who he was 
and what he did for us. Now we spoke earlier of unleavened bread and with dealing with this stuff. Okay, you have you have either bread that doesn't rise or bread that does rise. Uh, we put and you get that through yeast. Leaven is yeast, and the yeast will cause bread to rise. It's mixed with water, flour, and water, and uh, there's bacteria in the air, eleven bacteria, and when it's when it's put together, you can get a rising effect. That's called a rising agent. Okay, and we use many even baking powder at times, and there's other baking uh, baking apparatus that we use for, that uh, will uh, <clears throat> make dough rise. Now I'm not a cook, but I do know I have seen the process of of, of uh, matzah being made when I was. Part of that um, Jewish congregation, we went to a place that baked matzah, and they showed us how it was done. So it was really intricate, and they're very, very special. They're very, very exact on how they make the matzah. We walked into we walked into a bakery basically, but there were large ovens, and there's a rabbi there, and the rabbi inspects all the all the apparatus. He checks he checks for. Uh, food on the ground, he checks for any type of crumbs, he checks for all these things to make sure that there are no leavening agents, no agents that can cause bread to rise. And that's really, really important because leaven is going to be a big part of our discussion in the next few minutes and how and we're going to see how it how it cooks and cooks into what Jesus has done for us. But they, they're very meticulous in how they in how they um, uh, bake their bread. Now it takes about 18 minutes for, for flour and water to begin to rise with these leavening agents. Anything before that, it stays, it stays flat. But after 18 minutes, that's the time when the bread starts to rise. Now, most matzah is baked well under 18 minutes. Okay. Let me just show you here for a second. You have a couple of examples of various types of matzah. Now, this, this type of matzah over here, the square type, these are the types that you'll probably get in in any food store, they'll come in. They'll come in a box such as this over here. You'll see them in the food shelves. Even out here, I've noticed that they've been here. If you go to New Jersey, you have you have aisles of these things, okay? And they're all different types. There's spelt, there's wheat, there's rye, there's barley, all different types. But you'll see it basically in these type of boxes. And this is the most common. Now, this is uh, Passover matzah. Okay, there are matzahs that are made that are not for Passover. And uh, those matzahs are watched that are for Passover. What do I mean by watched? Well, there's a Hebrew word called shmur, and that word means watched or guarded. And when a matzah is watched or guarded, that means that from the time of the milling of the matzah to the time it gets to the oven, it's inspected and constantly watched over or guarded over so that no water or leavening agents can get to this mill, any type of agents at all that would cause that, that uh, milling process and that cooking process to have any type of um, fermentation, it's called, that, uh, that would cause the dough to rise. That's what shmura means. It's not important other than the fact that it's guarded and watched. That's the whole thing. This matzo over here is very special. Okay, this is the type of matzah that you probably would have gotten um, if you were cooking on a rock. Uh, it's kind of not, it's kind of round, it's kind of splattered. Uh, it's not the, not the type of square matzah that's very, made very specifically. Um, they taste different. This is more like a, more of a board type of thing. This is more like a cracker. Okay, um, and matz matzahs are made basically this way. I, I watched when they made this type of matzo, and uh, this is done also too. They just take the dough and just lay it down, and it's and it's very 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 flat and it's cooked. It's cooked in well under eighteen minutes, and it comes out looking like this. You can order boxes of these, but they're, they're kind of expensive. I use these matzos all the time in the Passover seder. Um, I put well, I'll put these out in certain trays on each table. This is, this is the matzah that, uh, that the Jewish people would well recognize and understand because this was like the bread of affliction. They wouldn't have laid it on a rock to have it come out looking like this. <laughs> that much is for sure. But this is the way it would come out. And uh, this is kind of a round shape, and even that's kind of, kind of watched over, so it's kind of round. 
the matzah would have been splattered pretty much all over the place with, with various shapes. And this is called shmura matzah. Okay? That's guarded, that's watched. That's something that no leavening agent could even get, in, get, in, get close to. When it, uh, when it comes from the milling all the way over into the ovens. Now, if that's really important for us to know. We're going to start going into the New Testament now. And we're going to go, we're going to read in 1 Corinthians. This, what I call the leaven principle. Now, the Apostle Paul, of course, you know, uh, was writing to the various churches. And he was writing to the church of Corinth. And he knew that this was pretty much a ragtag church. These folks were pretty much doing what they what they thought was right, kind of like in the Old Testament when people thought they did right in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, they had they didn't have a whole lot of leadership at the time, and they were pretty much doing things in the human sense. They were doing everything from a from a fleshy sense. They were getting drunk at meals. They were the things that things that would be in worship. They were just kind of doing their own thing. There was no organization. And Paul started writing these letters. He actually wrote first and second. And there's actually a third Corinthians. That was the, it was, we're told by theologians. But, but it seemed like that letter was lost uh, in any event. But um, Paul had written to them and really to put them in their place and to, and to show them what they, what, they needed, what they needed to do. Now, leaven was a really, really important part of this. And the Apostle Paul is actually speaking about leaven. Now, don't forget, it's important to know that the, the Rabbi Paul, or Rabbi Shaul, it's a, the Hebrew, but, but Paul was a rabbi. He was a Pharisee. So he understood so much of what this is about. He understood about leaven, about non-leaven. He, he understood about the Passover. He knew all the traditions that the, that, the, uh, that the Jewish people did, the festivals, he understood all these things. And so he, the majority of, of the Christians that were in Corinth uh, still were, there were a lot of Jews who had uh, come to know Jesus as Messiah. There were, of course, Gentiles in the, in the Corinthian church too, Corinth being, uh, being uh, a, a non-Jewish area. That, uh, that the Jewish people had spread out all along, all along the eastern uh, rim of the Mediterranean. And they spread out. And um, Jews were establishing Messianic synagogues, or synagogues, of course, that believed in Jesus. But they still had a lot of Jewish traditions going on. Of course, you had Corinth and, and, and Asia Minor, which is Turkey and those areas, and, uh, and in Greece and in other places like that in Corinth, where, uh, where you had a lot of Gentiles or non non Jewish believers. And so they pretty much were doing their own thing when it came to when it came to worship. I'm going to go ahead and read from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to take some select verses. Verses 1 and 2, and verses 6 through 8. And you're going to see something that I call the leaven principle. Now, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is such that there is fornication among you as such. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this thing might be taken away from among you. Now we go to verse 6. Your glorying is not good. When he says glorying, that they were not doing anything about this guy. They were just basically letting it go. And in that case, it was called glory. In other words, they're just allowing this and saying, no, that's all right. And unfortunately, we see things going on, even in Christendom, where we kind of glory in our own flesh, where it shouldn't be going on. And here, Paul is really letting them have it, really letting them know that your glory is not good. Continuing in verse 6. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, now, here's something really interesting. We're talking about this leavening process, this leaven principle, and now we hear about Paul talking about leaven. All right. Now, where is this coming from? 
Now we're talking in the New Testament. Now these are, these folks, are, this is just past, uh, past the time of Jesus. And he's explaining about this leavening. Passover was still being celebrated, certainly. And people understood, the Jewish people understood about, about the leavening. And we're going to go into that even further, but let's really go over this a little bit. All right, so there was this one man that was sitting within the, in the Corinthian church. All right, and he had to be dealt with. And Paul said there's no doubt that he had to be dealt with. But the problem was that the people were puffed up. The people were glorying all right, in what he was doing. Now, check that word puffed, puffed up, okay? We talked about leaven being rising, okay? They're talking about um, bread rising after 18 minutes, being puffed. Let's follow this. And you are puffed up and not rather having mourned that he that has done this thing might be taken from among you. He says your glorying is not good, verse 6. Know you not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now, when you take that little bit of rising agent into the flour and water, you just need a little bit, and the lump rises, and then you get leavened bread. All right? But the leaven must really mean something. It, the leaven is not just for bread. What in the world would bread just have to do with Jesus? What would it have to do with his resurrection? What would it have to do with anything like that? He says, your glory is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? The whole lump? He says, first, that you're puffed up. Number one, you are leaven. You are, you, you're, you are looking at this man in pride and arrogance. You're not doing anything about him. And there's a sin principle going on here. Right? There's a sin principle going on. You're acting in sin by being puffed up, by being leavened. Okay, go on and go on to say, says, don't you know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? All you need is one sin. Now, how many times have we heard this in our Christian walk? That it just takes one sin and, and that's it. Without the redemption, obviously, and death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we're doomed. We're a doomed people. Jesus would have been a great teacher. He would have been a great rabbi, but that's, what, that's as far as it would have been. And he would have laid in the tomb and that would have been the end of it. But he said that you guys are puffed up. You guys are acting in sin. And he says, a little, just a one sin, a little bit of leaven, it affects everybody, the whole lump. See? You see where this is going? And that is that when one sin is committed and it's let go, everything starts getting affected. And when we sin, you know as well as I, when we sin, that one sin can easily lead to a second and a third and a fourth, and we, and we just start not even thinking about it anymore. Before you know it, we just start getting involved and involved, and we become puffed up, and we don't even realize it. But it only takes one. Paul says this in verse 7. Now let's keep this in mind now. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Purge it out. Now, what does that mean to us? That doesn't mean that we that we heal ourselves in terms of in terms of salvation. It's not, we're not dealing with self-salvation. But we are told that we have to watch for ourselves. If we see ourselves getting involved in something that we shouldn't be, if we're talking or thinking or, or whatever we're doing, our practices, our behaviors are not right, we're to watch ourselves. We're to purge the old leaven. We were once, as unbelievers, the old leaven. Now we are what Scripture calls us, a new lump. Purge out therefore, verse 7, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as what? You are unleavened. We as Christians now are an unleavened group. Okay? Here's the, here's the matzah. Here's unleavened bread. We are that. Not the piece of bread. But what we are is an unleavened group that we have been forgiven of our sins, that we have been raised up by Christ. Our sins are forgiven. That does not mean that we don't watch our behaviors, that we don't watch what we, we say, what we, we don't watch what we do. We are to purge out, recognize what's going on, and to be people of the book, be Christians as God has proclaimed us to be. 
For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Okay? There's that, there's that term sacrifice. We talked about it earlier in the, in the Sunday school, about what sacrifice was. Now, we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, and most everybody that talks about, talks about our, our Christian walk saying, oh, Jesus died for us on the cross. Well, that's great. What does that mean? I mean, he died for us. The unbeliever would come and say, well, Jesus, I heard that Jesus died for us. Why did he die? I don't know. Well, why did he die? That's one of the problems, and sometimes it's so understood that that's the case, but we rarely understand why. And the fact is he died like it was in the Old Testament to sacrifice. That's why he died. And just like the animals were sacrificed, so Jesus was sacrificed for us. That's why he died for us. And that takes it next to the next step over here. Not only did he die for us, like, a, like the people would bring uh, animals, a lamb, a goat, or a pigeon, or whatever it might be, to the, to the temple to sacrifice for sin. But because an animal was an animal, it was a one-time thing. It, but it was no, there was no consciousness of sin. It was just an animal. But for Jesus being a man, being a man was that he represented all of humanity. His creation, his father's creation, God's creation. And in that creation, he was one of them. And he died for us, but now was buried and then resurrected again. Okay. This is why we can walk in newness of life. In newness of life. Verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast. Now, we talked about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they heard that. Now this is Paul talking that we can read in the New Testament. Let us keep the feast. Does that mean that we are bound by, by the law, by the Torah, by the first five books of Moses, that we must keep Passover, that we must keep and do the festival and do all the traditions? That no, that's not what it means. What it means is that we are to remember. We are to remember what Jesus has done. Therefore, let us keep this feast. Keep it in our hearts. Let's remember what Jesus has done. That the old leaven that we were before we became Christians has been purged, has been taken away. Just like that rabbi that went to the bakery that checks for the leaven on the ground. He checks to make sure that the facility is clean. He makes himself aware that there is a leavening agent, perhaps, that can cause the matzah that they're making, that shmura matzah that I was talking about, to make that leaven rise, and he didn't want that. That's why he can say that that, that, leaven, that unleavened bread is for Passover, that it's unleavened, and God commanded that. He says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. See how Paul associates leaven with malice and wickedness, with sin, with evil. This is what he's doing. He's saying that anything that's inside of us, we are an unleavened group here. If there is leaven inside of us, we are to be, we are to be, we are to purge that, take it out. That doesn't mean that we're perfect after we become believers in Christ, but what it does mean is that we are to be constantly aware of our status within the um, within uh, our walk with Christ. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Truth. Unleavened bread, sincerity, and truth. Verse 7 says, you are unleavened. We look at, the, we look at this matzah, okay? and we say that, well, it's a piece of bread, flat bread. It's more than that. It's more than that. It is a representation of what Christ has done for us. It's a representation of our job to be constantly aware of the sin that could creep in at any time. Now remember that we read in, in, um, in Exodus chapter 12 that God commanded that the Jewish people uh, clean the dwellings from leaven. I'm just going to read this real quickly. Uh, a couple of verses, verses 14 and 15 of Exodus chapter 12. It says, that, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away the leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats, uh, eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. 
All right, there's that commandment again about cleaning the house from unleavened bread. The house was to be cleaned from, from the potential rising agents, which was leaven. Now, the Jewish people before, before Passover, this is what they do. There's a Hebrew word for it, which I don't need to mention, but what they do is that there's a celebration before Passover. And it's the cleaning of the house. The Jewish people clean their houses from leaven or pieces of leavened bread so that it wouldn't mix, it wouldn't mix and there would be any chance that the matzah would be, uh, would be contaminated or fermented. And understand that in many Orthodox Jewish homes, they make their own matzah. They make their own bread. Okay? This is obviously being able to purchase and more and more of the, of the observant Jewish people will buy their bread and not make it at home. But in many other many parts of the world, that bread is made. Uh, in the Ukraine and Russia and other places, that bread is simply made, made in the big kneading trough, like I explained earlier. So the, what the Jewish people did, instead of a drudgery of going over and clean, looking all over the all over the corners of the house and looking for dirt and looking for looking for crumbs from leavened bread, they made it into a they made it into a little celebration. They had their kids go about. And, and with a feather and with a little scoop, they would take all the corners and clean all the areas of the house. Okay? And so they made, it, they made it a type of thing that was enjoyable, rather than make it a drudgery that I've got to clean the house again. No, what they did was they made it enjoyable. So the houses were clean from leaven. All right? They obeyed the commandment of God in a natural sense by cleaning the houses just as God had commanded. Can't fault them for that. However, when Paul says that you are, you are unleavened, you're a new lump, now we're taking this thing to another degree, we're taking it to another level. We are that. We are the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth and not in malice and wickedness anymore. We are to be a new lump. Now remember I said that Hebrew word, shmur, shmurat, that word means to be guarded to be watched. And that's what we're to be. We're to be this in example, but we're to be guarded and watched in our conscience and in our hearts. That anything that can approach leavening in us needs to be cleaned. We're going to go over this now. We're going to start really putting this together as we start getting closing and, and finishing this up. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, the Passion Narrative. I'm going to go into the book of Luke, chapter 22. We're going to, I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 20. Now, Jesus is in the upper room, okay? And we're going to, we're going to see about this, this meal that he's having. All right? So, let's go ahead. If you have your Bibles, you want to go to Luke, chapter 22. We're going to read straight through 1 through 20. Now, we're going to, this is where we start putting it all together. So, that's why I wanted you to think about the things that we talked about. The leavening agents, what the, what the people had done, deliverance, retelling of bondage, deliverance and redemption. I wanted the, everybody to keep this in mind all the time because all these thoughts will be flowing through us as we get to the last points that we talk about. All right, verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and scribes saw how they might kill him, for they feared the people. They then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the numbers of the twelve. And he went his way and, command, and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray, might betray him unto them. Let's go to verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, Jesus, sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare <clears throat> us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where will we that we prepare? And he said unto them, He said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into a city, into the city, there shall be a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters into. And you shall say to the goodman of the house, The master says unto you, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he showed them a large upper room furnished. And there that was to be made ready. And they went, verse 13, And they went and found as he had said, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, 
Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it. And he gave it unto them. He says, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. It was a Savior. They celebrated the Passover in the upper room. Passover is celebrated in a number of different ways. The Orthodox Jewish people will go through, um, will go through an enormous <clears throat> book, very, very, very thick. And it's an all-day and all-night affair. There's drinking there's all sorts of telling of stories of the, of the Old Testament. Don't think that just because these Jewish people that had the big black hats and sometimes they had the curls and the black coats and the black pants, that these, that these people are impervious to doing things that they want. I've, I've lived with them, I've studied with them, I've worshipped with them. I took part, of their, took part of their festivals as well, and they can get as rowdy as anybody. <laughs> and I've seen them, especially in the time of Purim. They get crazy, they start taking noisemakers and throwing things and they get drunk and they dance. It's, it's insane. Any of that. What happens is that um, the the, they celebrate the Seder very much so. And they use a book. It's something called the Haggadah. All right? Now this is, this is the typical book that I use. And when we, do our, when we do our Passover Seder, this I pass out to everybody. And in, and in, the, in, in this book is um, an order. And that's what the word Haggadah means. It means an order. And basically, you start the meal, and it explains the meal, and each part of the meal, the bread, the wine, and all that such, and where it all fits. But it's done from a messianic, or from Jesus' perspective, okay? But the book that, um, that Orthodox Jews use uh, is probably about this thick, okay? And it goes on all night, and like I said, drinking and cavorting and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and everything in between. There are secular Jewish people also, too, that just... You know, they have their satyrs, and it just goes on for an hour or half an hour or whatever. They say a couple of things, and they go eat and call it a day. And that's it. But nonetheless, whether it's secular, whether it's orthodox, or whether it's messianic, the Passover is celebrated. Okay. We need to understand that no matter what we think of in terms of the Jewish people, that this is something from the Old Testament, that this is something that that they did, that God commanded. God said something very interesting. He said, this is an ordinance that you keep forever. But wait a minute, I thought we weren't in bondage to these things anymore. I thought we weren't in bondage to festivals, to the Jew, to, to the Torah and the, and the law. What happened? What's going on here? But just as Jesus uh, came on the scene and he took the understanding of the law to another degree. He made it living. It wasn't something that you just did and walked away. What he did was he made it alive. Okay. And in, in that, uh, in that uh, life of living now, that how we live, those ordinances that were to be kept, we read this in, 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 in Exodus chapter 12, those ordinances are to be kept forever in here. Okay. Remember we talked about it. Purging the leaven, making, becoming a new lump. It's in here. We're to keep the ordinance and remember. Remember we talked about remembering in church services, that we're remembering things of the past. The same thing. We're to keep guard. Shmura. We're to keep guard of our hearts. We keep the ordinance, the ordinance, the festival, in our hearts. You don't have to keep the festival. You don't have to do Passover. You don't have to do Sukkot. You don't have to do Feast of Week. You don't do any of these things and it to be safe. Rather, every one of those festivals, with Passover being the main one, every one of those festivals are to be kept in our heart because every one of them has a, uh, has a relationship with Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done in our lives. John said in his Gospel, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We talked about the Paschal Lamb. We talked about that Lamb that was sacrificed at the time in Exodus. He says, he says to make the sacrifice, and that you take the blood, 
and put it on the door, uh, the, the, and the door, and the lintels, and the, and the upper parts of the door, so the death angel would pass by. That blood is the same blood in comparison, in parallel, to the blood that Jesus shed for us, that the death angel no longer passes us. We've been, we've been saved from this. We've been walking in newness of life, folks. We're not the old lump anymore. We're walking in newness of life. Jesus spoke of being the Passover lamb. John spoke of Jesus being the Passover lamb. Behold, he said, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Passover event is ultimately about the Passover lamb. And that's Jesus. There is a tight bond between the Passover and death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the, and the Resurrection Sunday that we will celebrate all Holy Week next week. And as we celebrate all these things, we need to remember that Passover is a key part of it. We are unleavened. We are a new lump. We're to walk in such things. We keep the ordinance in our hearts. We keep the feast. We keep the festivals. We keep the Passover. Passover, God related that. Passover was the head of the year. The Jewish people have basically four New Years. And it's the other three I'm not going to mention right now. It's not important. But the one big New Year is the ceremonial New Year. And that is Passover. And in this Passover, we're to remember that that's the top of the year, the head of the year. And that's, that is very, very, very important in, Jew, in the Jewish mind. Okay, Jim, next slide. Okay, ten important points to remember about the Passover. Now, we're, gonna, we're putting this all together, and I hope you're getting this idea of where all this is, all this is flowing here. Okay, number one, we, we celebrate the Passover, we do the Passover, so basically we know Bible history. Well, that's a good thing, right? We want to know what the Bible is saying. We can't know about the Passover unless we read about it. We go into Exodus and we read the Torah, the first five books of Moses, and we see what God is saying. So we get to know what Bible history is. And it doesn't mean we have to be theologians or scholars or anything like that. But God wants us to know all about him and as much as possible. So we get to know Bible history. Number two, we get to know how God thinks. And that can be scary. Because if, as God thinks a certain way and we're not following along with that, seeing that we have the mind of Christ, we should be. But we may not be. Once we start reading about God and how, and how he conducts himself, and we start seeing how he thinks. Scripture says in Genesis that we are made in his image after his likeness. If we're made in his image and his likeness, we ought to be thinking like him. doesn't mean we're God. doesn't mean that we do the things that, that, uh, that God does. But it does mean that we behave in the way that he wants us. And... We are, to, we are to obey Christ. We believe God can do all things. We want to know how God thinks. And to know how God thinks is to govern our own behaviors. Okay? We talk about the Passover. It talks about, again, that, that concept of what I call that leavening, that leavening principle. We get to know what this is all about and how God thinks of leaven and how, how God has seen, even in the past, thousands of years ago, how he's brought it to our time now and will continually bring it forward. The Bible is a history book, but a history of salvation and redemption. Okay. It starts in the beginning where things are created, all the way until the end where, where we, we read in the New Testament that in the times past in, in Acts chapter 17 that God saw those things and winked at them, but now commands everybody to repent. It's a growth book, and to know how God thinks we grow through that. Number three, Jesus celebrated the Old Testament festivals in the New Testament. Okay? So if somebody comes to you and say, well, I don't, I don't do all these things. I don't follow the Torah. I don't follow the first five books of Moses. The Old Testament is for the old, for, for then, and we live in the New Testament. Jesus celebrated the Old Testament festivals in the New Testament. Not only that, Paul told us to keep the ordinances of the festivals. All right? Keep them. We may, not, we may not have to do with our salvation, but it doesn't mean we keep them in our hearts. We keep them there, all right? So Jesus celebrated, as we are to celebrate, even if we don't go through the actual, the actual service, we keep it in our hearts. 
Passover, number four, Passover reminds us of the sin or the leaven that's inside us. All right? We went through a whole bunch of this leavening, unleavening, shmura matzah, this whole thing, looking at a piece of bread and it, it, it reminding us of the sin that's in our life that has been purged out through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but that can, can come in. The book of James talks about temptation, that we are to watch, and, and temptation is not the sin, but to fall to the temptation is the sin. It starts to break the relationship. I'm sure all of us have experienced it at one level or another, if we're honest. But the idea is to be aware. Temptation is like, a, is like the alarm going off. It's saying, wait a minute, something is drawing me to this. Why am I being drawn? Okay. Now that should be the alarm to say, you know what? I'm taking one step back. Or maybe I've got to take two steps back. If you're an alcoholic, it's not a good idea to drive by Kelly's Bar and Grill. It's just not a good idea. Because if the closer you get to Kelly's Bar and Grill, the closer you're going to look for a parking space. And that's not a good idea. We do the same things as well. Okay, we may not be alcoholics or ex-alcoholics. Maybe we were. I don't know, and that's not my business. But what it is, is that we, are, we need to be aware. We need to purge out that lump. If we are to purge out the old leaven, that means we must be aware that there was old leaven in there. Okay? Number five, and this is really important. Remember we read in Exodus, chap in Exodus chapter 12 about sweeping, about keeping your homes clean. Paul talked about purging the old leaven. We sweep our house clean. This is how we live our lives as Christians. We're to sweep our houses clean. Always being aware that our hearts are desperately wicked, as Jeremiah said. Who can know it? That's why we need to be reminded all the time. That's why we need to read scripture all the time. We need to understand what God is telling us to warn us to keep away from the sin that so easily takes us away from God, that breaks relationship. Okay, Jim, next slide. Number six, Exodus tells us how to escape sin. Okay? The Passover, the service. We understand that. When we, Lord willing, we do have the Passover service next year in the Seder that we, that we do. See, in that Seder, uh, in the, in the very, I mean, you don't have to put this up to you, but in the very first picture, you saw this plate with all these little elements in it. Every one of those elements meant something. All right? And when it means something, these are things that we're to remember. Some things talk about sin. Some things talk about sacrifice. Some things talk about life. Some things talk about what, what the Jewish people had to eat. We remember, okay? The Exodus tells us how to escape sin. It tells us all about it. The Passover is our constant reminder of keeping the festival inside of us, keeping it as an ordinance. The Seder, number seven, the Seder links Old and New Testament. Again, we talked about it earlier. People are telling you, oh, I don't go back to that time. I am a New Testament Christian and the whole thing. I've heard this dozens of times. The fact is that, yes, we are redeemed through Christ. Christ died. We read the New Testament, and that's where it's at. That's where we read it. But the Passover, the, the, Seder, the Passover Seder links the Old and New Testament together. Folks, it's all one book. If God wanted you to have two books, he would have sold two books. One an Old Testament, one a New Testament. But he didn't. He put the Old Testament in one spot, and he put the New Testament in another spot in the same book. And that's what's important, because it's all the same. It's a progression. It's a time, it's a time of the beginning, and we start learning about God and, and how we grow. It's a, it's, a book of, it's a book of our life. The Jewish people, the Jewish people see things, and they see things in, in life and growth. They call them life cycles. What it is is that, is that people grow from a little, little child and they grow into an adult and ultimately die and the next generation takes over. Well, that's what the Bible is. The Bible starts in the, in the, in the, in the Torah, the first five books, and he starts teaching his people. And what does he say after so many of the ordinances? He says, do this, I am the Lord, I'm your father. Do this, I'm your father. That sounds like a family thing, doesn't it? Sounds like a family, but that's the same thing. You, that's what a father and a mother will tell their child. Do this. Why? I'm your father. I'm your mother. God says the same thing to us. He says, from, from the beginning, that we grow this way, where we start, we see the beginning of life from the, from, the, from the Torah all the way into the New Testament. It's a book of life. 
of growth. Passover reminds us of redemption. We've spoken about that. It's because we remember that we have been purged, that we've been redeemed from the old leaven. Passover is for Christians as well as it is for Jewish people. Especially, now we're getting a little taste of this now, but Lord willing, when we are able to do a Seder, we'll really see that number nine come to pass. Passover is for Christians as well as Jewish people, and I would say even more. They were the progenitors. They were the first. They experienced such hardship. But we benefit from their hardship. Talk about suffering. We benefit from their hardship because we can grow, because we can walk now, as it says, in the newness of life because of what Jesus did, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Number 10, you get to eat some good food. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that, right? Jim, next uh, slide, please. Summing it up, we speak of bondage, deliverance, and redemption. We were in bondage to sin, right? Before we became believers, we were in bondage to sin. But we've been raised again. Number two, the exodus from Egypt reminds us from reminds us of the deliverance from sin. Again, we discuss this again, but I'm going to keep driving this part this part home. We are we are to remember always the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. As Israel had to trust God, Christians must trust in the work of Jesus as well. Without the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, there is no redemption. So all of this that we've talked about is under one umbrella. All of this is under one umbrella. The matzah, the unleavened bread, the sacrifice of the, of the Paschal lamb, the Passover lamb, the blood put on the doorposts of the homes, the cleaning of the homes from, un, from leaven. This is what God was talking about from the beginning. God is remarkable. He, start to, he starts to teach us about these things with people going through hard times so that, so that we can grow, so that they can grow and that we can grow. That, that, there would be, that there would be sin removed from our lives. God is a relational God, and God wants relationship with us. Sin impedes that relationship. It stops it. And the more, the more we get comfortable with sin, the more this keeps going on and the relationship with God it splits and splits and splits and gets worse and worse. We don't want that. Folks, let's remember the Passover. Let's remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's remember that we need to be, we need to watch and guard our lives. We use that word, Hebrew word shmur. We need to watch and guard our lives. That no leaven entities comes in. We need to sweep our homes clean. Thank you for the, thank you for this time. I hope this has done something and people can get an idea of before we get an idea of how this all fits together. Thank you. Thanks.